presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from the members of WPSU. From the studios of Penn State Public Broadcasting, this is To the Best of My Knowledge. Good evening, I'm Graham Spanier. Tonight we'll be talking about future energy strategies. As the world's population increases and fossil fuels decline, scientists continue their search for alternative sources of energy. Tonight we'll talk about what the future holds for energy sources. We'll also take your phone calls at 1-800-543-8242. You can also email us at response at psu.edu. And now let's meet our guests. Dr. Tom Richard is the director of Penn State's Institutes for Energy and the Environment and an associate professor of agriculture and biological engineering. Dr. Amy Glassmeyer is the director of Penn State Center for Policy Research on Energy, Environment, and Community, and a professor of geography and regional planning. Thank you both for joining us. Delighted to have you with what I think will be a very interesting topic. Uh, Dr. Richard, let's, let's begin with you and ask you to explain to uh, our viewers and our listeners what exactly do we mean by alternative fuel? Well, we've been using uh, fossil fuels for a long time, and uh, more recently there's been a lot of interest in various types of alternatives. Some of them are renewable fuels like solar energy and biofuels, but some of them are new ways of using fossil fuels. Uh, for example, making liquid fuels out of coal, which is something we have a lot of research on right now. And by fossil fuels, we mean? Uh, coal, petroleum, oil, natural gas. Mm -hmm. uh, would you venture a guess, uh, just to begin our discussion, what are the alternative fuels that hold the most promise for the future? Well, in the short term, we have a number of things that we know we can do right now. Um, biofuels for liquid fuels. Um, we see a lot of interest in efficiency and solar, which tie together very well, as I think we'll talk about in more detail. And, um, and I think there's a, an awful lot of interest in near term uh, some alternatives look, look, look like uh, battery-powered cars. We heard about that a lot last week. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Glassmeyer, if you took the typical American family, what kinds of things are out there that they could take advantage of even with the technologies that are available today uh, within a household? There are lots of technologies they can take advantage of. Um, first thing they can do is to consider conducting an audit of their own ho household energy usage to determine whether appliances uh, may need to be replaced because they're very large energy consumers. They can check very simple things like their windows. They can look at their utility plugs to determine whether or not there's drafts coming in. They can essentially look at their housing envelope and determine the extent to which it is um, energy efficient or needs to be um, enhanced in some way. You see, uh Occasionally, and we see it in, in Pennsylvania, these big uh, windmills, they have long, thin blades, and often you see a, a bunch of them captured together. Now, is it true that wind energy generated this way can actually affect the climate in a certain area or have some unintended consequences apart from their ability to generate energy? There haven't been really dramatic impacts on climate as we think of it. Uh, although there, eventually, if you put enough windmills on the landscape, you might slow down the wind a little bit. Some people in some regions might think that's a good idea. Um, the, the things we've heard the most about are the impacts on the environment, particularly birds and bats. And the new designs of windmills and those propeller blades have been actually able to reduce that dramatically. So that there are far more birds and bats hitting most, most of the buildings uh, in, in cities than we have in the wind farms. Mm -hmm. But there are concerns, and the, I think the biggest one in most neighbors is visuals. Some people find them kind of attractive and interesting, I suppose, but others yeah. don't, to each his own, I guess. 
I came here from Iowa, and there on the landscape, windmills were something pretty attractive, something different, and something new. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Glassmeyer, you deal with uh, a lot of the policy issues around this. Uh, let's talk for a moment about how Pennsylvania is different uh, in its approaches and its policy compared to what we might find in some other states. I think Pennsylvania is um, becoming a leader in energy policy, starting from a platform of creating a renewable energy portfolio standard which specifies how much of the energy used in the state has to be uh, derived from renewable energy and alternative sources different combinations, um, but we see beyond the production of energy and the distribution of energy, uh, a number of policies that the state's engaged in to increase energy efficiency at from the community level, household level, um, government level. We also see the state talking about the ways in which uh, the development of energy can lead to economic development. And so if you look across the country, few states have a fully integrated program, and I would say Pennsylvania's in the top five. Mm -hmm. Is there any state that's considered the ultimate model of uh, work in this area? Probably historically California was because California was really the first major place that you saw the implementation of renewable strategies from the state level mm -hmm. and you can go back to the 1970s, early 1980s and you can see policies. Um, other states have emerged as players as uh, new technology or technology has been enhanced. So the Midwestern states like Iowa that, that uh, Tom came from, Iowa has become a very effective agent for the development of wind energy. So it really depends on what the resource base is for the state mm -hmm. as to the types of policies that are being um, favored. Now how about countries? Where does the U.S. Mm -hmm. stand in relation to other countries and its creativity or its policy making, its adoption of, uh, of laws? If you asked that question five years ago, uh -huh. it would um, be a story of America from behind. But I would say now there has been a very significant increase in the respectability and appreciation for renewable energy and alternative energy um, as, a, as a policy subject. Um, there are leaders in the world I mean, that I would say from the standpoint of technology development, corporate position globally that are leaders beyond us, such as Denmark, Germany, uh, China's coming up very quickly. You know, five years ago, China didn't really have uh, a, a major company producing photovoltaic um, cells for the collection of energy through solar, and now they have two companies in the top five worldwide. So you, it's a very dynamic environment in which many countries are, are participating. Mm -hmm. Our national policies are in many ways not as progressive as our state policies. Do you have a similar view? Any, any other countries you would mention in that mix? Well, I, th I think the European countries have been engaged in this a little bit more seriously. But there are also some uh, maybe surprises, uh, Israel, for example. Um, and uh, you know, I think we're going to see some interesting things in a number of U.S. places that you didn't see them very recently. Uh, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, I hope, is one. But Hawaii has been doing some interesting things lately. Yeah. If you're just joining us, I'm Graham Spanier, president of Penn State. And this is, to the best of my knowledge, on WPSU, Penn State Public Broadcasting and the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Our topic tonight is future energy strategies with guest Tom Richard, director of Penn State's Institutes of Energy and the Environment, and Amy Glassmeyer, director of Penn State Center for Policy Research on Energy, Environment, and the Community. You can join the conversation by calling us at 800-543-8242 or email us at response at psu.edu. And speaking of email, let's uh, take one here. I welcome comments regarding the ethanol plant under construction in Clearfield, Pennsylvania. The National Academy of Sciences, Scientific American, and virtually all scientific studies opine that ethanol as made from corn is a very poor choice. Well, I'll take that one at least for starters. Yeah. And and I would say it's a, a very poor choice, but there are worse choices, and one of them is gasoline made from oil. So the marginal impact of, of corn ethanol is a positive one, whether it's greenhouse gases you're looking at or um, the, you know, the, the net energy uh, value and the reduction in fossil fuels. But there are a lot of challenges with it. Corn is one of the most challenging uh, plants to grow for the environment. 
And one of the things we're doing at Penn State is actually working at a number of other crops that we can make ethanol out of both now and the future. Short term, uh, winter barley, canola for biodiesel, a couple of great plants that we can grow in the wintertime here and actually improve the environment. In the long term, we're looking at cellulosic ethanol, which is actually, a, there will be a pilot plant at, uh, adjacent to that facility in Clearfield mm -hmm. where that company will be exploring that, that potential for the future. Now, you might need to explain what is meant by cellulosic. And ethanol. I'd love to. Yes. So, um, most of us think about plants as this big thing, like a tree with leaves and stalks and things like that. But uh, the, the, and all of that is actually sugar. We, we uh, right now are making fuel from the grain, the grain of corn or, or barley. But we can actually take the rest of the plant, which is about 70% sugar. Once we take it apart, and that's the great challenge, is to actually break apart that structural sugar that's in these, these fibers that we call cellulose and hemicellulose. Mm -hmm. Let's take a phone call now. It's uh, Mervyn calling from Penfield. Welcome to our show, uh, one of our loyal viewers. You're on the air. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Spanier and panel, I would like to encourage you to discuss geothermal heating and cooling. We designed and built our house 10 years ago. It's a 2,500-square-foot house, and we heat and cool the entire house, and our average cost is about, about $140 a month. Normal fuels would be eight to nine hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. That's quite a remarkable difference, and, and we don't hear any leaders talking about it. The mm -hmm. president never mentions it, uh, and and it's an incredible supply that is anywhere there's ground. And remind folks who may not be aware in our broad statewide audience where Penfield is, so they can get a feel for what the temperatures are are like there. Yes, uh, we're uh, 13 miles uh, from Du Bois mm -hmm. and the same distance from Clearfield. And our house is located about 2,000 feet above sea level uh, outside of Penfield. It's in, in so it, Clearfield County. It, it would be one of the colder spots in the state then, oh, particularly absolutely. at that elevation. Yeah. Well, c comments on that? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. So yeah. first of all, geothermal is a fantastic form of energy. And there are really two kinds of that. So that word gets used in a couple different ways. Um, some people think of uh, hot springs and volcanoes. And actually, Iceland is doing a tremendous job. And there are parts of California where they're able to tap into that very hot water and pull up steam from underground and use that to power electricity and also to, to build uh, heating systems for district heating. The type that I think you're talking about is where we're taking advantage of the relatively moderate temperatures that are deep in the ground and using those moderate temperatures to both cool our houses in the summertime and heat them in the wintertime. And it is a resource that's available everywhere. Uh, through our Engineering Facilities Institute, we're actually working with a number of state agencies and state facilities to put those kinds of systems in the ground to help out, out those that's kinds of buildings. Correct. It's, it's never below 55 degrees in the ground, and when we have a, a, a blanket of snow for a month or two, we get seven or eight degrees more. Mm. Yep. Is the kind of savings he's talking about typical? Could, uh, would other people experience that? Yeah, they're, they're quite dramatic. And, and somebody, I'm sure, has estimated the, the payback period. I know it would vary by climate and what kind of system you put in and all, but uh, what... Do we know what, what the payback period is for an investment like that? Could, could I tell you, Dr. Spanier? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our research showed, when we researched this years ago, it would pay for itself in 10 years. It yeah. paid for itself in six. No kidding, in six years. Yep. All right. Fantastic. Very, very helpful information. Let's turn now to Dick, who's on the line from Johnstown. Hi, Dick. Thank you, Dr. Spanier. And, uh, happy holidays to you and your guests. Thank you. Uh, I... Uh, would direct this to either of the uh, commentators. I believe it's Tampa Electric, their Polk plant in Tampa. It's a coal-fired utility. I believe there may be one in Missouri that, that has the very latest technology uh, to burn coal for electrical use, drastically reducing the harmful emissions. Uh, since coal is our most abundant resource, fossil fuel, and, and indeed if what I've been told, actually, I bought some stock in Tampa Electric. It's TECO, T-E-C-O. Uh, are you familiar with this plant and the process? And if so, do you feel that uh, that perhaps may be the uh, uh, partial solution to our energy crisis? Thank you. 
I'm not aware of the company. I do know that there's a significant amount of money being invested by the Department of Energy and by <coughs> private industry in attempting mm -hmm. to reduce the emissions associated with coal, and there's been significant advances made in recent times, but I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with the company itself. We have some folks working in that area of research at Penn State, do we not? We certainly do, and there's actually a couple of pieces to those advantages to the new coal technologies. Uh, one is the increased electricity output um, going from somewhere in the mid-30s, which is kind of the, the average of our older coal plants, up above 50 percent in some cases by taking advantage of some newer technologies for capturing some of the process heat more effectively. And the other is reduced emissions uh, from more clean, clean burning systems uh, where new designs of the, of the fluidized beds actually allow them to get more energy out of the coal. So there's more um, electricity coming out the, the uh, wires, but also less pollution going into the air. Tom from Waterford, you are on the air. Well, thanks for taking my call. Yeah, it's always interesting. I have a farm. Do you, any of you guys have a farm? No. I used to. Oh, yeah? We're, we're all too busy sitting at desks, <laughs> but uh, doc, yeah. Dr. Richard is a, is a farmer from way back. Oh, that's excellent. Hey, the neat part about that is that, um, you know, theories as opposed to reality are interesting because I'm more of a realist. Um, I have a farm, and it's got good ground, but I'm not going to let it go fallow, and I uh, was going to get alternative energy systems like switchgrass, uh, you know, that I thought maybe I could as an investment for the future for energy. What I'm running up against is that, you know, these celluloids, the lignum, and all this other stuff, and these uh, plants that are, are viable, there's no um, technology that, would, that makes it work on a big scale. You know, and that's, to bring these things to fruition, it's very hard to get the manufacturing end of it to make it work, because it's all, in, it's all new. And it, it, it bothers me a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are on the early part of the curve for a lot of these things. And so the, the payback periods, the investment for an individual farmer or homeowner uh, might not be convincing to people yet. Um, but is there, is, there, is there any viable, they say that in this switchgrass, are you familiar with that? Absolutely. That, you know, the lignum, the, the, the binding agent, like if, uh, if you were in Indian artifacts or something, you know, in pottery that they made, what they would do is they would put little shells or something to make a binding agent. But the most beautiful thing about this grass is this will uh, bind to itself. It just needs to be extruded in a manner. And that's where I get really thrown. I mean, because remember, at my age of 53, by the time things go down through the pipeline, you're the educators, um, I might be 93. <laughs> well, I, I hope 53 not, 53 doesn't sound so old to some of us these days. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, let's talk, hope, let's talk about you know. the science and the economics sure. of, of this. Yeah. Well, this is, there's two different paths to making energy from switchgrass or other cellulosic feedstocks. The, the first is, uh, and the one we've probably heard most about, is the uh, biochemical fermentation. I was talking about it accessing those sugars that make up 70 percent of wood. And, and that, the technology has been advancing very dramatically. Uh, a number of faculty here at Penn State are making important breakthroughs uh, every year. Uh, and interestingly, over the last two years, uh, about a half a dozen companies have, have put private money into this particular technology to build first-generation commercial-scale plants. Those aren't being built in Pennsylvania, but there are half a dozen of them going up around the country. And there's an, um, half a billion dollars of private money and another half a billion dollars of federal money going into those to make real, real facilities that will make tens of millions of gallons of ethanol mm -hmm. that way a year. What we are doing in Pennsylvania is we're taking plants like switchgrass and sawdust and, and other uh, materials like that and compressing them, taking advantage of some of that um, uh, glue-like substance that you talked about in the lignin, and making pellets that we can feed into both wood stoves at home and also into boilers and commercial boilers that uh, increasingly we see schools, hospitals, and other facilities putting in place. Dr. Glassmeyer, uh, can you give us a brief tutorial on how the use of alternative energy sorts out in our country. Uh, is it a, a few percent of what's going on, or is it bigger than that? And, and realistically, what's the ultimate potential? I, I, I think, you know, it all sounds very interesting, but, but where are we when we look at the big picture? Well, right now, as one of the um, commentators noted, coal is the largest uh, fuel source for electrical generation. 
Uh, we've seen r significant changes in the last uh, five years in terms of the growth in renewable energy as it relates to solar, wind, and biofuels. It's now up at between eight and 10%. Nuclear energy is seven or 8%. Um, as to the future, I think that there are lots of forecasts that would suggest that renewable energy might be a um, primary source of energy, not something that's just a partial source of energy. It's really about the deployment of that infrastructure that we need, that we don't have enough um, actual uh, technology being produced to implement solar or wind um, uh, as rapidly as people would like to see. So we have the potential, but the manufacturing process is actually um, choked up. We, uh, if you would like to buy a turbine, they're sold out completely uh, beyond um, 2010. If you want to put in a, f a solar system for residential heating or for commercial heating, there's also l long lead time. So we may wish to implement more than we actually have the capacity to do. I think one of the most interesting aspects of the recent presidential campaign was how the candidates were almost stumbling over each other to prove their support of nuclear power. Uh, because in, in previous elections, you saw people saying, no, no, not going to do it, not interested, no new nuclear power. And now you had accusations that Obama wasn't supportive of nuclear power. Well, yes, he was. McCain wanted to build a specified number of new plants. And you didn't hear that much pushback as we did five, 10, 20 years ago, that there was something very, very wrong with nuclear power. Uh, might we see more of that? And how does that fit into this overall picture? Um, I, uh, oh, go ahead. I'll start. Um, so we are, well, I think we are going to see more of that. Uh, there's about 30 active permits right now, both expansions of existing facilities and some new facilities that, that uh, companies want to cite. Uh, the, the firms that are in that business are hiring like mad to try to put more engineers particularly in, in place. Um, there are still some challenges to nuclear. We haven't really sorted out what we're going to do with the, the waste material, uh, and we do need to address that. But when uh, we recognize that this is one of our lowest carbon fuels that we can actually work with, and when organizations, environmental organizations like Greenpeace come out in support of it, then people have to look at it a little bit harder, and I think there's really some opportunities there. And when we talk about fossil fuels or alternative fuels, where do you define nuclear power in that continuum? It's a non-fossil, non-renewable energy source. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, in a sense, it is fossil. It's not, you know, it's, it's been in the earth for a long time, and we would run out of it if we didn't recycle it. Yeah. Uh, so. Okay. Got a lot of callers calling in. Please uh, join us at 1-800-543-8242. Our next caller is from Lidditz. Mark, you're on the air. Yes, hi. I don't want to take up a lot of your time, but I've been in conservation all my life, wildlife resources and natural resources. And I believe that we do need to conserve things. But I will be the first to tell you, I think the current ethanol program is a joke. And I'll tell you why. I've had four-wheel drive vehicles all my life. I've had them in some of the worst off-road conditions you can think of. Water up over the hood of my Jeeps and so on and so forth. Last year in November, I traded my Nissan Xterra in which was getting 14 miles of the gallon back and forth to work for a Toyota Prius. And at that time, I was getting 49 miles to the gallon. Now I'm down to 43 miles a gallon, and I watch my gas mileage every day. I work in the transportation industry. My manager was also in the transportation industry in terms of building 18-wheel uh, trucks in years past. I work with a guy that drove several race cars, um, go-karts, things of that nature. These are people that know how to monitor fuel mileage. I'm not saying that ethanol is a bad idea. I'm just saying that right now in its current form, I think we're wasting a lot of money, and I don't think we're doing the environment a whole lot of good. Thank you, and I'll turn my okay. TV back on. Comments about that? 
Well, let me jump in because one of the um, very important things to know about ethanol is that it does not give you as many miles per gallon as gasoline does. Um, about 20% less in, in the current engine designs. And part of that is because the molecule actually has oxygen in it, which makes it clean, burn cleaner, but you're carrying around that oxygen, so you don't have as many carbon and hydrogen bonds that you get energy out of in your tank. And so the energy density of it's lower. Now, that should translate into lower prices. And again, in the Midwest, where people are used to uh, buying a lot of ethanol fuels, they do. The, the prices are typically 20% or, or uh, less that relative to gasoline. That doesn't always show up in the blends that we see in other parts of the country, and it should. And I think uh, educated consumers can help drive those prices down. But is that down. because of the tax structure, uh, subsidization, or is it just the marketplace working? It's, in, it's infrastructure, for one thing. It's uh -huh. not necessarily that readily available. It depends on the actual gasoline distribution system. Yeah. And, you know, there are subsidies for the ethanol, too, right now that are built into the system, too. Right. So, well, uh, don't uh, some people claim, and tell us whether it's so or not, that uh, the energy that's required to produce ethanol results in more overall use of energy than if you weren't using it at all? So true, or, true or false? Generally false, but again, if you find a patch of ground that grows corn really poorly and you don't fertilize it and you, uh, you know, go through all your regular other energy intensive harvesting and tillage practices, you can actually grow corn that has a lot more energy invested in it than you can get out of it as fuel. That's rare and on average our, our corn in the United States will produce about 30 percent more energy than the fossil fuel that goes in. So that's the kinds of savings you're getting. Now when we look forward towards, uh, well, towards biodiesel type fuels, we get a, a factor of three or four times more energy out than the fossil energy we put in. And if we look at cellulosic ethanol, it could be a factor of eight or ten times more out relative to the energy we go in. Get in. What are the policy issues that swirl around uh, the, the science, uh, the actuality of it all? One issue that's associated with moving to a cellulosic or even a corn-based ethanol uh, economy is the geographic implications of going to that scale. So we can see, for example, we did a study here at Penn State looking at um, what amount of energy could be generated from the landscape here in terms of the uh, hillsides and all of the other materials that we could call uh, um, uh, non-fossil based fuel potential sources. And uh, what we found was that we could take the whole county and we couldn't produce uh, a, a very large share of what we would need in the way of gasoline. So the, right off the bat, to, to move to a land-based energy system, we have to realize that it's going to change the way that which the landscape works. Another issue that's important is the absence of a distribution system. That is, how are we going to get all of the material that we need to actually generate the energy, and what is it going to mean for our road systems? Another issue is we don't actually have the workforce available yet to work in these new industries, and so we're seeing states very rapidly trying to build up the technical capability from everyone from driving the trucks on the site to uh, somebody who's managing the landscape. So that's still um, a ways ahead of us in terms of um, the needs to actually make this a real possibility. John from Alexandria is on the line. Hi, John. All right, thanks for taking my call. I uh, salute you for talking about the gains that we've made in terms of emissions in terms of coal-fired power plants, but mining coal is a dirty process. And while we've, you know, made some gains on emissions, um, the mining process is still dirty, the transportation process is dirty, burning it is dirty, and then placing coal ash is a very dirty process. And I'd like to point out that the placement of that ash is being done in coal field communities down in mines where those communities have been victimized once by the mining process and now by the placement of the coal ash which is polluting their wells. And so I, mm -hmm. I personally do not believe in clean coal. <laughs> okay, well um, that's more of a statement than a, yep. than a question but you're welcome to comment on it. Uh, well I'd like I know to hear others comment. Yeah, well we, we do have a lot of faculty who are trying to uh, get into the science of cleaner coal. And, and not only the conversion of that coal, but also some of the environmental impacts you describe in terms of the mining of the coal and, and the community impacts of, of what that fossil fuel means in those communities. Um, one thing I want to remind us all, though, is there aren't any easy solutions to this challenge. 
Uh, coal is our biggest available resource right now, and if we didn't have it, then we wouldn't have 80% of what we've got in terms of electricity, maybe 90% right now. So we've got to find trajectories to move forward to better alternatives, but we also have to do as good a possible job with, with the reality that we have a lot of fossil fuel right now and that, that we will depend on coal for the next many decades. I think another issue that um, we're beginning to see more of is discussions within communities about what the impact of coal development is. And that's an area where um, education and uh, cooperation between the parties, individuals living in communities and companies wishing to explore the resources really has to take place. And while in the past we may not have had a very good history of doing that, I think there are attempts to be more forthright about what the environmental implications are of that type of energy development. Our next caller is uh, nearby in State College. Malcolm, welcome to the program. Hi, Dr. Spanier. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Dr. Richards and uh, Dr. Glassmeyer. I'm a student in the AB department, actually. Tom might recognize my voice. <laughs> and uh, I actually had a class with Ms. Uh, Glassmeyer some time ago, the first cause class you may or not, may not remember. Um, my uh, question to you guys relates to an article I read about um, power such as wind and wave power. Um, Basically, the premise of the article was it's never going to come to fruition because you can't m make money off of, you can't corner the wave market, you can't corner the wind market. Yes, you can build windmills and then pay, uh, charge people for the electricity you generate, but you're already at a discompetitive advantage because with corn, you can grow the corn and then sell it and then somebody's making a profit. So with energies that are out there, solar, wave energy where you can't really tap the source of the energy the profit margin is going to be less because you have to invest in the infrastructure then you have to charge for the electricity and the profit margin is going to be less so my question to you is in that um, instance for this to progress are we going to be required to have the government step in and subsidize these industries so that they can be competitive or is it better left to the free market when the oil does go to $5 a gallon that these are finally competitive? And which do you think, essentially what I'm asking is, should the government step in and help to promote these industries, or should we leave it to the free market? And I'll, uh, Thank, yeah, thanks for your question, and, uh, Malcolm. Sounds like you might have gotten an A in your class. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if you give many of them out. Well, it's a difficult question to answer in any uh, exact way because there's so much about new technologies um, that make them uh, uh, viable and at what time and uh, in, in time and also what um, has to be the price of uh, competing uh, energy sources. And in some cases, if we look at history as an example, in most instances, new technology has ar arisen from government interve interventions, either through subsidies or through investments in research and development. So there are ways about uh, new technology development that can have government sponsorship besides just purely regulation or incentives. David from Logantown, you're next on the air. Good evening. I was, uh, I would like your guests to comment on the fact that the large projects seem to, uh, such as ethanol and uh, wind, seem to push out consideration of efficient small scale projects such as home heating, where those awful outside boilers that pollute are all over the place, but there's technologies that let you burn it very efficiently. And uh, Austria and Germany both subsidize that type of heating. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we spent a, uh, sent a team to Austria this last year to actually explore that because their small-scale biomass program has been incredibly effective and is now up to powering about 10 percent of that country, which, by the way, is about the same size and, and uh, similar topography as here in Pennsylvania. So yes, those, those smaller scale systems are really important. Uh, we're doing a lot of work right now with something called the Pennsylvania Fuels for Schools and Beyond program, trying to put biomass fired boilers into schools and hospitals and other systems where an individual school might save, uh, in, in one example, $200,000 a year on their fuel bill. And that translates into uh, teachers that don't have to get laid off, uh, better programs for the students, uh, some great opportunities to actually save energy and improve education at the same time.
Another factor that argues for um, multiple scales of production has to do with the transportation cost of mo moving the inputs. So it very well may be that a smaller scale facility in a geographic area makes sense where you don't have to draw as large a volume from such a long distance. And so we're just, I mean, some of the statistics show that there isn't necessarily an absolute uh, maximum size that you have to achieve in certain of uh, these um, energy sources in order to have the lowest cost if you take transportation costs into account. Well, thank you for that question. And Gary from Fogelsville, you're on the air now. Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you and your distinguished guests. Uh, I'm self in the transportation of uh, the windmill blades uh, to various parts of the United States. And uh, one of the things that we, we seem to be hauling a lot of blades out to Illinois, uh, Iowa, Texas, uh, West Virginia. And I did get to do some work of uh, hauling blades into the uh, farm, uh, the windmill farm at, at uh, Locust Ridge near Shenandoah, Pennsylvania. My question, though, is are you aware of, uh, of what plans for the future are in Pennsylvania of expanding wind energy projects? Uh, I'm immensely interested, in both for the well-being of our country, but also, I guess, as a financial interest, too, you know, as I'm involved in the transportation of the, of mm -hmm. the blades to the field when it goes into effect. The further yeah. away, the better for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but as a citizen of Pennsylvania, you'd be very interested in yeah, I making like shorter drives. I, I'll start. Yeah. For, um, part of the reason why you're shipping the blades to other parts of the country is because their wind energy resource is um, very high quality. So the Midwestern, upper Midwest is very high quality. Texas is very high quality. They have also had significant investments in their wind um, energy field, so it's no surprise you're taking them there. Pennsylvania has in place a series of uh, policy incentives which are going to encourage further wind development. And as we go forward in the future, in the near term, I think we're going to see um, significantly larger amounts of uh, the energy generated in the state from wind. Mm -hmm. And I might point out that uh, Penn State as a university is one of the major consumers of wind energy. We've allocated a certain portion of our budget to uh, purchase wind energy, and we're trying to up that amount. Mm -hmm. Michaela from Bowlesburg, thanks for calling in tonight. Yes, uh, thanks for tonight's program. And actually, my question uh, speaks directly to what you're, you just mentioned. Uh, I'd like to know what commitments Penn State is making for University Park Camp campus for existing buildings, for future construction, uh, geothermal or solar strategies, for university cars and trucks. Uh, there has been uh, so much waste uh, on campus, and with tuition rising, we have an even greater responsibility, I think, to act as quickly as possible. Yes, we do, and it's a very big thrust of ours. In fact, uh, not this last one, but my State of the University address before focused on the environment and some of the things that we're doing. As I, I mentioned, uh, we use a lot of wind power. We only build green buildings now. Uh, that's just a requirement for all buildings that we do. They have to reach a certain level of energy efficiency. We're retrofitting our other buildings so that we uh, have a continuous program of becoming more energy efficient. We have the uh, number two person in the university's physical plant that leads an initiative to deal with environmental issues. More and more green roofs going up, a building that is actually going to be occupied uh, starting this week. Our, our new law school building uh, is a very green building with a green roof, and that will be a great model, as was our forest resources building and uh, our LEED certified uh, uh, building for the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. We have students who go around on Friday nights and literally turn off all the lights on campus that people left on during the day and, and during the week. Uh, we have one of the major recycling programs in the country and we recycle our effluent. We have uh, water efficient uh, shower heads and all the showers. Uh, I, I could go on quite a bit. When we started the newspaper readership program that's now in 500 universities in the country, we have a massive program of 
recycling those newspapers and there was a spin-off company that turns them into uh, pellets and things that can be used in uh, in gardens. We recycle the waste from the residence halls and uh, in addition to uh, what he does in his research, Dr. Richard, uh, you consult with the university on a number of these areas and there's probably another dozen things at least that I've left out. The list does go on. You did mention fuels though and we're using biodiesel at a 20 percent rate in our all of our diesel vehicles. Uh, the tractors, the trucks, everything that's running around the campus. Not on the coldest days of the year because that turns into a little bit of a challenge. But whenever and we, we have can. The, the largest hydrogen refueling station this side of the Mississippi. I think another thing to say is that um, Penn State is a leader in assisting organizations around the state in trying to become energy efficient. We run and uh, we support an organization called the Local D Development Districts of Pennsylvania, which are charged with providing energy efficiency knowledge for schools, hospitals, local governments, and nonprofits. And we provide technical assistance. We also provide a convening place, and the knowledge that they're gaining and they're d developing is then being distributed in the community. So we have a secondary role in trying to provide leadership and support for the state as a whole to, to use energy as wisely as possible. If you're just joining us, I'm Graham Spanier, president of Penn State, and this is to the best of my knowledge on WPSU, Penn State Public Broadcasting, and the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Our topic tonight is future energy strategies with guests Tom Richard, director of Penn State's Institutes of Energy and the Environment, and Amy Glassmeyer, director of Penn State Center for Policy Research on Energy, Environment, and the Community. You can join in the conversation by calling us at 1-800-543-8242 or email us at response at psu.edu. And we're getting a lot of email and a lot of callers. Uh, it's a topic of great interest. So let's go right away to Altoona. John, you're next in the queue. Uh, thanks for calling in tonight. Yes, Dr. Spanier. I, uh, I'd like to pose this question to the two panelists. Uh, in the upcoming uh, Obama administration to take over in January, during the campaign, he uh, at the later stages of the campaign anyhow, he posed that he was for clean coal technology and also nuclear. Now we just heard that uh, Mr. Sal or, uh, Ken Salazar, Democrat from Colorado, is going to be the Secretary of the Department of the Interior. Uh, Mr. Salazar has been a staunch opponent of any coal uh, technology and also nuclear and also Mr. Obama made a few statements uh, off camera that he would tax the coal plants out of existence now those two things just don't coincide uh, something is, isn't right what, what do you think is going to happen sir? or b the two panelists what do you think is going to happen I would say to begin with we're going to have uh, a significant amount of investment in uh, all things energy. I think that uh, the material that I read from Washington and the people that I talk with in various agencies lead me to believe that energy is going to be a very important part of uh, the, the reconstruction and the, the reconciliation of the current economic problems that we have. In terms of coal and the end of coal, I think most people looking at energy today realize that we have to use everything that exists, that we can't have a single strategy of only renewables or only coal or only nuclear, that we have to have a blend because none of the technologies, all the technologies are developing at different time frames and they work in some places better than they work in others. Uh, and so to be prudent, you have to have a blended strategy. Kyle from Huntington, welcome to our program tonight. Hello. Um, Hi, Kyle. My question is, um, you know, we, we run these tractor trailers up and down the road. They average around five miles, uh, miles to the gallon. Um, locomotives run up and down the railroad tracks, pulling uh, millions of tons of freight. And, uh, you know, they, they're, they're probably using, uh, you know, uh, a considerable more fuel, but they're doing a lot more. And but they've had this technology since the forties and fifties, and I don't know why they couldn't implement it into a uh, into a tractor trailer and make the tractor trailer get twenty twenty five miles a gallon and have more power than they do right now. And I'll just hang up and let you all talk. Well, there are some tremendous efficiencies that you can gain. The, the locomotives gain a lot of theirs because they've, they're running on steel tracks, so there's a lot less friction, and the tracks, of course, have been graded to make it all a lot easier. And actually, there have been tr tremendous advances in that industry, and in, in, in fact, here in Pennsylvania. So the General Electric locomotives built out by Erie 
Um, they've got a whole new design that's actually been, they've been selling hundreds of them that are both uh, higher efficiency and a lo lot cleaner. There are some interesting things going on in the truck industry as well. Uh, we have faculty working with Mac Volvo, uh, redesigning those to try to make them more efficient. Um, it's not the easiest way to move things around in individual vehicles, but um, it's getting better, and it, it needs to get a lot better over time. Mm -hmm. Andy from Dubois, you're next on the air. Good evening, Doctor. Hi. Um, I would just like to have the panelists uh, talk a little bit and explain uh, the renewable energy portfolio of Pennsylvania and uh, compare it maybe with other states. Mm -hmm. The renewable energy portfolio standard is a policy that specifies that a fraction of energy that is um, sold within the state has to come from a range of energy sources. Um, there are many states, there are 27 states in the United States that currently have that policy. The differences between states have to do with the blend of a uh, fraction of a particular type of en uh, energy that might be required. So for example, uh, Pennsylvania may have 8% uh, of uh, wind that's required or California might have 15 or 20 percent of its energy that has to be from renewables. So what the real difference is between the portfolio standards um, between states is the, the amount of energy that they expect um, to be used within the state from renewable sources. And next we have Robert from State College. Good evening, Robert. Good evening. You're on the air. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Spanier. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to comment on the, uh, the, the one of the earlier call, callers from uh, Penfield yeah. and his geothermal system. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that there's been a, a overlooking of the potential of that possibility. I mean, with with he said uh, he was getting a six-year payout. Uh, he said when he bought it, it was uh, talked about ten-year payout. Seems to me that's a pretty modest uh, amount of uh, investment, uh, a pretty good return for uh, that system, and it's it's been, as he said, barely ever mentioned. Uh, is is there any possibility or any movement toward maybe uh, uh, giving the homeowner some kind of a, an incentive, a tax write-off, or something like that to uh, to uh, move this forward? Uh, mm -hmm or at least to maybe uh, publicize it a little more. Well, we, we do want to publicize it more. And, and uh, you know, the biggest challenge is that capital investment. That you have to put those 10 years worth of payback in the ground right now. And, uh, and that's expensive, and a lot of people aren't able to do that when they buy a home or try to upgrade their heating system. Well, that's uh, why the government could possibly help, help out there. And, it, and as he said, it isn't 10, it's six years. Right. So, so I think the, the general principle is we've got some investments that we need to make in homes and that will pay themselves off relatively quickly and what kinds of financing mechanisms are out there. And there have been some very creative suggestions made. Not a whole lot of banks have jumped up to, to offer them yet, but where we could actually put in an energy mortgage attached to a house where you could go ahead and get that upfront investment and then pay it off as part of your mortgage on a monthly basis. One of our emailers on this very topic uh, says, uh, does putting loads of tubes into the ground have negative effects on the earth. In the Matrix, I assume he means the movie, they made a reference to this by saying that man had destroyed the earth by shoving tubes in it. What would you say about this? Has this been investigated? So the, the earth is a large, large, large ball that has a lot of heat in it, or cooth, if you, if you mind the phrase. Uh, or the other types of the year. So uh, yes, there can be very small impacts locally on that. And if you're using ground source cooling in the summertime, then you're heating up your soil a little bit. But it's not going to be dramatic. The, the amount of, of uh, heat that's down there is much greater than what you take off for your house above. Uh -huh. Thank you. And Curtis from Spring Mills, you are on the air. Uh, yes, Dr. Spanier. Uh, thank you very much for taking my call. I was wondering whether Pennsylvania offered any incentives for homeowners or farms to use alternative energy such as for solar or wind or biofuels or with the view of net metering in the state. Mm -hmm. So you hit on it with your last comment there, the, the net metering. And um, what that is is a policy that we have in the state where if you put energy into the grid and then take it back out later, 
uh, you essentially can save yourself what the retail value of that electricity is as opposed to the wholesale value. And that's a new law just in the last couple of years. And that has made it possible for a number of farmers to put in anaerobic digesters to turn their manure into electricity, other farmers using uh, solar and wind. Uh, so landowners actually do have a way now to be a generator of electricity. Now, there aren't built-in benefits if you produce a whole lot more than you consume, but at least to more or less meet your own needs, you can get some real financial benefits now. There also are um, pass-throughs or programs that the state of Pennsylvania administers with resources that come from the federal government. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture, as an example, um, has programs to provide resources for energy efficiency. I think you're going to see in the next administration that there'll be a significant amount of money that comes from the federal government to try to um, uh, assist people in engaging in more effective energy-related activities. You know, if you listen overall to the the callers tonight, it sounds like people want to do more, but they all are asking, well, what are the incentives? Is there a plan? Is there a program? Uh, can they get a little help with the investment? Uh, in some ways, I wonder if it might be harder because now it might be a little harder to get a mortgage or, uh, you know, it's, it's hard enough to buy the house, but then they have to put another few thousand dollars in it to put a system in. Uh, are, are people very well informed about what's out there and, and what the policies are and what they can take advantage of? The, uh, there's a variety of sources of information. One source of information that's important to, to pay attention to and to seek out is the extension service within the state, which has uh, their finger on exactly what USDA programs as well as economic development um, policies are that relate to energy. Uh, I think it's also clear from what we're seeing in the newspapers that uh, in Washington they're trying to use the existing vehicles or they will use the existing vehicles to try to distribute funds um, to both implement renewable energy um, technology as well as purely energy efficiency. So we're really looking for ways to do it. And people should be watching carefully what's going on in Washington because this is where they're going to send a lot of money down to communities. Mm -hmm. Bud from Altoona, thanks for calling into our program tonight. Yes, I was watching your program and I haven't heard anything uh, on methane gas yet. That is, uh, it's very replenishable. Anything that will decay or rot, storage plants, what have you, methane gas, uh, it seems to me there would be less money involved uh, producing this and getting it to a natural gas line, which natural gas is a methane gas of some sort. And uh, the overhead shouldn't be as, as expensive as your um, wind power, so mm -hmm. forth. Dr. Richard, what do you say about methane gas? Well, it is an important resource, and, and many farmers are putting up digesters. It's, it's not really cost-effective unless you've got a pretty large farm, though, typically 800 to 1,000 cows, which we don't have that many large farms at that scale here in Pennsylvania. Before you get cost-effective, now, there are farms that are doing it, smaller farms, uh, with some subsidies from the state or federal governments. But um, the, the technology is in place in most of our wastewater treatment plants right now, including the Penn State facility. And, um, and so that methane is then used primarily for electricity, but can also be used for heat. We're also doing research on some really uh, interesting other technologies to take the energy in wastewater and convert it into other types of energy. Uh, Bruce Logan's been doing some work with both microbial fuel cells and microbial electrolysis cells that can produce hydrogen from wastewater. Very exciting work. and. Uh, hopefully going to be spawning some new companies in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. well, one of the difficulties, if you take a landfill as an example, which generates methane, is it's one thing to generate the methane, it's another thing to get it to the actual um, final source, uh, final point of use. And so we can see places that actually can tap uh, land uh, fills as an example, but then the question is how do you get it connected into the system? And this is true for energy overall, is that we can generate it on site, but that's only a part of the story. There's a much uh, more articulated element to it, which is to get it from where it is to where it needs to be. Let's squeeze in a quick question from David from Punxsutawney. Good evening. Um, this has been science fiction up to this point, but um, is there any research going on now on uh, fusion energy? And um, if so, where are we at now? Okay. So Jump in. There is continuing research going on in fusion, and it does continue to look attractive, but we still haven't figured out how to hold this really hot piece of the sun in any way that we can manage it effectively. So um, it's interesting, it's exciting, uh, it's 
still, in terms of practical use, science fiction for now, but uh, hopefully science in, in a couple of years. What do you think is the big new issue that's out there that you're kind of excited as an academic to wrap your arms around uh, in this general area? Um, on Friday, we had Tom Tuffy from Penn Future talking in uh, the Department of Geography's coffee hour, and he mentioned uh, the, the uh, coordination of a series of policies at the state level that will make solar energy very attractive and attractive at the residential level in terms of uh, individual household implementation. I think that that um, has tremendous potential, and he describes it as being disruptive, which means that it's going to change the ways in which uh, energy is generated. It's going to change the way in which um, energy uh, authority is is enabled and is governed. Uh, so it has really significant implications. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to end the program by referring to one of the emails that we received. We couldn't get to many of them, but. Uh, we have one from uh, one of your colleagues on behalf of all of your colleagues, Dr. Glassmeyer, wanting to uh, thank you for your service at Penn State because you are winding down and are going to be moving to MIT. And uh, they wanted me to pass along their view, which I share, that uh, we thank you for your great service here and wish you well in your new position. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, we want to thank our guest, Tom Richard, director of Penn State's Institutes of Energy and the Environment, and Amy Glassmeyer, director of Penn State Center for Policy Research on Energy, Environment, and the Community. And thank all of you for watching. Tonight's program will be stored in an electronic archive that can be accessed through WPSU.org. This site also links to online resources on tonight's topic. We hope that you'll join us again on Tuesday, January 27th, that's our next program, when our topic will be childhood obesity. To the best of my knowledge is a production of Penn State Public Broadcasting. For all of us here at WPSU, I'm Graham Spanier. Have a good night and happy holidays. Presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from the members of WPSU. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.